listening to Java Chats with Dr. Sandy, your personal brew of life with a teaspoon of medicine. Real women, real life, real chats. Hello all and welcome back to another edition of Java Chats with Dr. Sandy. Did any of you catch that video that went viral recently showing an elderly woman being moved by hearing Swan Lake on audio? If you have not seen it, I highly recommend it. It's on the net, YouTube, and other channels. The video shows a music therapy session of a patient slash resident, Marta Gonzalez, who was a prima ballerina in her younger years and who danced in a New York ballet company in the 1960s. In the video, Gonzalez, who reportedly died in 2019 after developing Alzheimer's disease, which by the way is the most common form of dementia, is seen listening to Swan Lake and reenacting from her wheelchair what appears to be the choreography of the ballet. Despite the effects of Alzheimer's disease on her memory, Gonzalez seemed to immediately feel an emotional and physical connection to the music she once danced to on stage. And I assure you, the video of her remembering the dance is sure to give you goosebumps and make you wonder how the mind and muscles remember the things that we may have all forgotten. Check it out. It not only supports Alzheimer's and dementia research, it also supports the use of music and the arts in the form of healing and rehabilitation. Music is powerful. It is an international language with strong roots in brain development. For example, as per USC neuroscientists, music instruction appears to accelerate brain development in young children, particularly in the areas of the brain responsible for sound, language development, speech perception and production, and reading skills. As such, music therapy has shown to be beneficial in the rehabilitation of Alzheimer's and dementia patients. Additionally, according to John Hopkins, listening to music also helps reduce anxiety, blood pressure, reduces pain, improves sleep quality, and overall cognition. The mental and recall ability of this ballerina, Marta Gonzalez, albeit fleeting, then despite her advanced age, is the ability to demonstrate and recall her memories, even if in passing. It is so impactful, so powerful, and promising indeed. Have any of you seen the movie The Notebook, a 2004 romantic drama? A tearjerker for sure. There is the part of the story of how the main character develops Alzheimer's dementia, and her husband reads her letters depicting their life together in hopes of capturing her memories. Additionally, the wife, upon first learning that she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, writes a letter to her husband where she has promised to continue and make attempts to recover her memory if she could. A moving story for sure. And for any TV watchers out there, the current show This Is Us depicts an aging main character, Rebecca, dealing with the progression of dementia. And the show does a really good job at noting how dementia also affects the family unit. Do any of you know anyone who has had or is currently suffering from dementia? And hence, my episode today, Why Can't I Remember Anything Anymore? Where we will look at dementia and why this matters. But before we do that, what is dementia? Who has it? How does it manifest? And why should we care about it? In general, dementia is a group of conditions characterized by impairment of at least two brain functions, such as memory loss and judgment, problem solving and thought process that may interfere with daily life. These functions may affect memory, language, skills, perceptions, problem solving, self-management, ability to focus and pay attention. Some people with dementia have a hard time controlling their emotions and change in personality may occur. In general terms, dementia is a condition that causes changes in the brain. And while there are several types of dementia, Alzheimer's dementia accounts for 60 to 80 percent of all cases. Dementia is not senility or senile dementia, which is a term implicating that mental decline is a normal part of aging. I know some very spry and cognitively intact 95-year-olds, sharp as a tack, so to speak. The causes of dementia vary. While Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia in older adults, other dementias, including Lewy body dementia, as may be seen in patients with Parkinson's disease, dementia associated with Down syndrome, frontotemporal disorders, vascular dementia, and mixed type of dementias are other types as well. The latter is a combination of two or more dementias, as some people may have both Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. 
Additionally, certain medical conditions can be associated with serious memory issues that can look like and mimic dementia. And interesting enough, the cognitive decline improves as the underlying medical condition is treated. Also, we must not overlook the potential side effects of medication, stress, anxiety, depression, and certain vitamin deficiencies as well as significant alcohol intake, brain tumors, infections, delirium, head injury, thyroid, kidney, and liver issues that may present as cognitive decline and dementia. And yes, sometimes the overlap of diagnoses make it challenging to get the right diagnosis in order to achieve the right treatment. This is why it is important to obtain a detailed medical history, physical exam, neurological, neuropsychological testing, cognitive testing, lab work, and brain scans. And since some dementias have genetic component, genetic testing may also help people know if they're at risk for the development of certain types of dementia. So as we can tell, there may be many reasons why a person's cognitive status may decline, and that is why dementia is a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning other treatable causes have been ruled out first. So much to talk about with regards to dementia and certainly meriting several chats, but for today, let's focus on Alzheimer's type of dementia. According to Alzheimer's.org, more than 5 million Americans of all ages have Alzheimer's dementia, and an estimated 5.8 million Americans aged 65 and older are living with Alzheimer's dementia in 2020. 80% are aged 75 and older, and 1 in 10 people are aged 65 or older. Overall, that's a lot of people living with various stages of dementia. You may even have a family member who has dementia and or succumb to the consequences of dementia. And the alarming thing is that the time from diagnosis to death varies as little as three to four years if a person is older than 80 when they first diagnosed to as long as 10 or more years if the person is younger. Alzheimer's disease is currently ranked as the sixth leading cause of death in the United States, but recent estimates indicate that the disorder may rank third just behind heart disease and cancer as a prominent cause of death for older people. That's staggering. And although treatment can help with the management, there is currently no cure for Alzheimer's dementia or any kind of dementia for that matter. And there's also no vaccine for this one, at least not yet. So what is Alzheimer's disease specifically? Alzheimer's disease is described as an irreversible progressive brain disorder that slowly destroys memory and thinking skills and eventually the ability to carry out the simplest of tasks. In most people with the disease, those with late onset type, symptoms first appear in their mid-60s and beyond. And while rare, there is an entity known as early onset Alzheimer's that occurs between a person's age of 40s to mid 60s, which is more associated with a genetic component. So why is it called Alzheimer's disease? The disease is named after Dr. Alois Alzheimer. In 1908, Dr. Alzheimer noted changes in the brain tissue of a woman who had died of an unusual mental illness. Her symptoms included memory loss, language problems, and unpredictable behavior. And after she died, he examined her brain and found many abnormal clumps, which are now called amyloid plaques, and tangled bundles of fibers, which are now called neurofibrillary or tau tangles. At that time, they knew the brain looked different, but they didn't know or what they exactly meant. And how does a normal brain compare to a brain with Alzheimer's disease? There's a very good synopsis of what happens in a video that's put out through NIH that explains the following. In healthy people, all sensations, movements, thoughts, and feelings are a result of signals that pass through billions of nerve cells or neurons in the brain. Neurons connect to each other through electrical charge that travels down axons, causing the release of chemicals across tiny gaps to neighbor neighboring neurons. Other cells in the brain called astrocytes and microglia clear away the debris and help neurons stay healthy. In persons with Alzheimer's disease, toxic changes occur in the brain that disturb this healthy balance. These changes may occur years or even decades before the first signs of dementia. Researchers believe that this process involves two proteins, beta and beta amyloid and tau, which somehow become toxic to the brain. 
It appears that abnormal tau accumulates, eventually becoming tangled up inside the neurons, and beta amyloid clumps turn into plaques, which slowly build up between these neurons. As the level of amyloid reaches the tipping point, there is a rapid spread of tau throughout the brain. But tau and beta amyloid may not be the only factors involved in Alzheimer's. Other changes that affect the brain may also play a role over time. The vascular system may fail to deliver sufficient blood and nutrients to the brain. Additionally, the brain may lack the glucose and energy needed to power its activity. Also, chronic inflammation may impact the brain and affect the ability of microglial cells to clear away debris. The neurons lose their ability to communicate. As neurons die, the brain shrinks. This process is noted to begin in the hippocampus, a part of the brain important to learning and memory. People may begin to experience memory loss, impaired decision-making, and language problems. As more neurons die throughout the brain, a person with Alzheimer's gradually loses the ability to think, remember, make decisions, and function independently. A very sad process. Imagine slowly losing your ability to think clearly, to focus, to process information. Imagine your life slipping away. This is why achieving a deeper understanding of the molecular and cellular mechanisms and how they may interact is vital to the development of effective therapies. Much progress has been made at identifying various underlying factors involved, such as brain imaging, that allows us to see the course of plaques and tangles in the living brain. Blood and fluid biomarkers can also provide insights as to when the disease starts and how it progresses. More is also known about the genetic underpinnings of the disease and how they can affect particular biological pathways. These advances enable the development and testing of promising new therapies, including drugs that reduce or clear the increase of TAP and amyloid proteins in the brain. Therapies targeting the vascular system, glucose metabolism, and inflammation, as well as lifestyle interventions like exercise or diet and behavioral approaches such as social engagement may enhance brain health. What exactly does Alzheimer's disease look like clinically for the patient and the family? There are approximately seven stages of Alzheimer's ranging from stage one, none or very mild decline, to stage seven, very severe decline, and symptoms can vary from person to person. Memory problems are typically one of the first signs of Alzheimer's and decline in other aspects of thinking such as finding the right words, visual spatial issues, and impaired reasoning or judgment uh, may also signal the very early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Mild cognitive impairment, MCI, is a condition that can be an early sign of Alzheimer's, but not everyone with MCI will develop the disease. People with Alzheimer's also have trouble doing everyday things like driving a car, cooking a meal, paying bills. They may ask the same questions over and over, tell the same stories over and over, forget what they may have just said a few minutes prior, that is short-term memory issues, get lost easily, lose things or put them in odd places, or find even the simplest things confusing. Research has also associated olfactory loss, that means the loss of sense of smell or anosomia with cognitive decline, mild cognitive impairment, or Alzheimer's disease, and the decrease in ability to smell not related to infectious infections, colds, sinus-related issues may also be a marker for Lewy body and vascular dementias. Autopsy studies have linked a loss of ability to identify odors with plaque and tangles in the olfactory bulbs and other regions of the hippocampus. As the disease progresses, some people may display an inability to learn new things, difficulty with language and problem solving, difficulty carrying out multi-step problem solving, failure to recognize familiar people, restlessness, agitation, anxiety, tearfulness, especially in the late afternoon and the evenings, called sundowning. Eventually, people with severe Alzheimer's are completely dependent on others for their care with their inability to communicate, weight loss, seizures, difficulty with swallowing, moaning, increased sleeping, and loss of bodily functions. A common cause of death at this stage is aspiration pneumonia that develops when a person cannot swallow properly and takes food and liquids into the lung instead of the air. 
So what can be done and are there any treatments available? Treatment alternatives, as noted by the Mayo Clinic, include medications known as cholesterolase inhibitors, as one way Alzheimer's disease harms the brain is by decreasing levels of the chemical messenger acetylcholine. That's important for alertness, memory, thought, and judgment. Cholinesterase inhibitors boost the amount of acetylcholine available to nerve cells by preventing its breakdown in the brain. Cholinesterase inhibitors cannot reduce Alzheimer's disease or stop the destruction of nerve cells. And these medications eventually lose effectiveness because dwindling brain cells produce less acetylcholine as the disease progresses. Common side effects can include nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Starting treatment at a low dose and working up to a higher dose can help reduce side effects. Taking these medications with food may also help minimize side effects. People with certain types of cardiac arrhythmias should stay should not take cholinesterase inhibitors. This is why working closely with healthcare providers in the treatment of Alzheimer's is important. Currently, there are three types of cholinesterase inhibitors that are cur- commonly prescribed. Donepazil, a Aricept, is approved to treat all stages of the disease. It is taken once a day as a pill. Galantamine, or Azadine, is approved to treat mild to moderate Alzheimer's. It is taken as a pill once a day or as an extended release capsule twice a day. Rivastigmine, or Exelon, is approved for mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. It's taken as a pill. A skin patch is also available that can be used to treat severe Alzheimer's disease. Memantidine, or Namenda is another medication and is approved by the FDA for the treatment of moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease. It works by regulating the activity of glutamate chemical involved in brain functions, including learning and memory. It is taken as a pill or syrup. Common side effects may include dizziness, headache, confusion, and agitation. The FDA has also approved a combination of denapazil and nemantidine named Namzaric, which is also taken as a capsule. Side effects with this medication may include headaches, dizziness, nausea, and diarrhea. And while there is work looking at targeting inflammation by using antibody treatments, as stated, there is no cure at this time for this. So if there's no cure and only certain medications are available, is there anything that we may be able to do to prevent Alzheimer's dementia, or if not prevent it, then slow it down? Good nutrition is always important. Certain foods are associated with increased health benefits. For example, leafy greens such as kale, collard greens, spinach, Swiss chard are just some leafy greens high in essential B vitamins like folate and vitamin B that can help reduce depression while also boosting cognition. Instead of just eating these leafy green vegetables and salads, you may also may want to add these vegetables to soups, stews, and chilies. You can also puree them and add them to sauces, pestos, and hummus. Berries such as raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, and cherries all contain flavonoids called anthocyanin, which can also stop the progression of brain damage triggered by free radicals. These and other berries are also packed with antioxidants and are a wealth of vitamins that can help reduce inflammation and help maintain good brain health. And why not add nuts? Pecans, almonds, walnuts, cashews, and peanuts are loaded with healthy fats, magnesium, vitamin E, and B vitamins, all of which may promote good cognition and ward off signs of dementia. Women over the age of 70 who consume at least five servings of nuts per week are shown to have significantly better brain health than women in the same age group who don't eat nuts. Another study shows that anti-inflammatory phytochemicals in English walnuts can reduce inflammation of brain cells and maintain optimal brain health throughout the aging process. This is all very interesting. Additionally, we hear lots about omega-3s such as olive oil, flax seeds, and fatty fish like tuna, salmon, mackerel, which are examples of foods high in omega-3 fatty acids with with DHA that may help your brain stay healthy. And it's not just good for the brain, but also for overall good nutritional value. And in speaking about Java, since this is Java Chats, did you know that coffee may contain certain antioxidants that can help with brain health and may offer protection against Alzheimer's disease? At least this is noted in the mouse model studies. 
Additionally, green tea contains compounds that may promote relaxation while also improving focus and attention. Kobacha, a fermented drink made from green tea or black tea, may promote beneficial bacteria to the gut. In prior podcasts, we chatted about how the gut health affects brain health. Orange juice from real oranges, which is rich in vitamin C, may also provide neuroprotective effects. Blueberry juice is loaded with antioxidants, and eating blueberry smoothies made from green leafy vegetables such and turmeric lattes may also be beneficial. Turmeric may increase the body's production of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which may improve brain function, and herbal teas such as sage, ginkgo balboa, ashwagandha, ginseng, rhodiola, and kefir drinks may enhance brain function, though more research is warranted certainly in, these, in this area. And again, like I said in prior podcasts, before starting any supplement, discuss with your healthcare provider to make sure that there is no side effects when compared to any other medications you may currently be on. So why am I talking about boosting brain function? Because it's something we can all do on a daily basis, and we don't have to wait until we start losing our memory. It can be an excellent preventative tool. Exercising our brain can improve memory, concentration, and focus, and people of all ages can benefit from incorporating a few simple brain exercises into their daily life. For example, doing a jigsaw puzzle, and it doesn't have to be a thousand-piece puzzle either. Start small if you like. Puzzles help with visual spatial abilities and sequencing. And how about playing cards? Card playing can stimulate thinking skills. And vocabulary building helps too. Research shows that many more regions of the brain are involved in vocabulary tasks, particularly in areas that are important for visual and auditory processing. Learn a new word every day and use it five times on a given day. And get up and dance. Learn a new dance. Practice an old dance. Dancing helps the processing speed. Try using all your senses as you experience a new meal at a restaurant or go for a walk. Learn a new skill or teach someone a new skill. No one is ever too old to learn and no one is ever too old to teach. Listen and play music. It also helps improve your mood and creativity. Try taking a new route home without getting lost, of course. (laughs) Changing things up a bit from the old routine helps. Meditate, exercise, don't be a couch potato. Take up Tai Chi and laugh. Learn a new language. There are so many benefits to being bilingual. And focus on another person. And focus on your surroundings. Be in the moment. Like, take note of what smells do you smell? What sounds do you hear? What is someone really saying, wearing, doing? It's the attention to detail that also stimulates the brain. And of course, stop smoking and get good restorative sleep. And if you have sleep apnea, get checked out. Adequate oxygenation during sleep is key for brain function and memory too. So our brain, we can't live without it, so we might as well take care of it, right? Which brings me back to the ballerina I mentioned earlier, Marta Gonzalez, listening to Swan Lake and remembering her routine. The act of remembering is also exercise for the brain and for the soul. Well done, Marta. And kudos to the staff that shed light on her story. Memories are good to have and good to make. Keep laying down new adventures. Exercise your brain. Take care of it. Keep moving and keep smiling. Getting older comes with experience, lessons, wisdoms, and skill. Let us appreciate that process as well. Thank you for joining me today in exploring the topic of Alzheimer's dementia. And if you've not seen the movie The Notebook or are into romance novels, I highly recommend it. Other movies dedicated to the topic of dementia are Still Alice, Away From Her, Aurora Borealis, and A Song for Martin. Relax, enjoy a cup of something delicious, 
enjoy the movie and drop me a line of Java Chats with Dr. Sandy at gmail.com and share what you think of these movies as well as share your experiences with someone with Alzheimer's. Spread the word and share your knowledge. Until next time. Thank you for choosing Java Chats with Dr. Sandy as your personal brew. Real women, real life, real chats.